Elliot and I are doing, we're, we're both uh, seasoned organic farmers, longtime members of OCIA. Uh, my father was first certified in 89, but a year ago when I got on the OCIA board, it, we, we uh, uh, decided, we, my family and I, decided to start trying to do some outreach. And so the, the uh, one thing that was missing in organics uh, was practical how to, how do you do this, how do you do that. And there was a definite hole for that kind of uh, information on the internet. And uh, I served on the board and our, one of our foundation core mandates was peer interaction and outreach. And so we started the YouTube channel. So I'm not going to go through this. You can get on YouTube and you can find uh, Geiger Farm on YouTube and we're making educational videos. I think we have 11 now on basic nuts and bolts, how to organic farm. Not going to go through that. What I'm going to give you at the Mother Earth News Fair this year I did a presentation. And so at the Mother Earth News Fair, uh, my presentation, I wanted to come up with basically, well, we introduced this, but I also wanted to give people some ideas and then let people ask questions. So I'm gonna give you some ideas. The problem with farmers, he spends a lot of time by himself in machines doing repetitive tasks and his mind wanders <laughs> and he thinks things. And every now and again, if he's a smart farmer, he'll remember that thought. He'll develop it later when he's spending more time doing a repetitive task. So these are some of the big thoughts that I have had that I thought would be relevant to people thinking about the transition or thinking about how you approach the system of organics. Because organics, they're a, uh, a way of life. They're a system. They're not a tool. Men employ tools. Organics is a system in which man interacts with his surroundings. Not that he controls them, but he interacts with them. So the first thought, uh, I think of my farm as a mine or as a tool. The crop on my farm is my family and my children. The farm is a vehicle or a tool that I use to raise my crop, which is the next generation of farmers and stewards of resources. I have a strong uh, connection to where we farm. I am the uh, sixth generation farming in Brown County, Kansas. Family came there uh, before the Civil War. Mother's family came to Kansas at about that same time. So that's the first big idea. My children are my crop. And the farm is just a tool that I am using to raise them. Successful farming, I, I still get Successful Farming magazine. And uh, every now and again, you know, I thumb through it. And every now and again, there is an idea in it that jumps out at me. So they had this idea, they jumped out. They had an article. And it said that uh, you have to do everything you can to maximize every harvest you have have because the average farmer only has 50 harvests. To me that is a limiting or a, uh, uh, a reductionist way to approach your farm. Uh, I have a saying, I, I'm not sure that I came up with it, but I like to use it and that saying is, I am a link in the chain. When you take the multi-generational approach and you don't think of I only have 50 harvests, I have to get, get, get all I can get. You start to think of it as, I am a link in the chain. I'm not the chain. What is the chain? The chain is people interacting with their environment and surviving, thriving, being in harmony with their environment and having uh, some degree of continuity. So we're back to the first thought. The farm is a mine. What good does a mine do you if you have no miners? In order to get gold or a good result from a mine, you have to have miners and you have to have a mine. If you have miners with no mine, you have no gold. You have a mine with no miners, you have no gold. You have to have both. So we need to put attention into people as much as we do attention into the land. 
That was the first big thought. Second big thought, this is not my quote, uh, uh, just because you don't know how to do something doesn't mean it can't be done. So when we were undertaking our transition in the 80s, uh, sometime there in the early 90s, we went to a farmer. He was not certified organic at that time. He later became a chapter member, but uh, he had a farm, livestock, small feedlot, varied crops. He was basically a organic farmer because he didn't like to use chemicals, fertilizer, etc. But he had a balanced operation. And I had not seen a balanced operation before in actual production. And to me, that was a revelation. And uh, so one of the things at OCI, OCIA that we attempt to foster are the outreach things, the farm tours. Just because you don't know how to do it, doesn't mean it can't be done. So travel, talk, listen, network, and when you get an opportunity, take it. Uh, third thought for somebody starting out. You have to find your production niche. The reality is, is we can't all be the world's best cattle farmer. We can't all be the best corn raiser. We can't all be the best soybean raiser. In the organic system, you obviously need to do to be diverse and you need to have a systems approach to stuff. But the most important thing is you need to figure out what your strengths are, what you like to do. If you hate cattle, maybe you shouldn't open a feedlot. If you hate vegetable farming, maybe you shouldn't vegetable farm, maybe you should approach something else. So you need to figure out what you're good at, what your environment is good at. My environment is not necessarily good for raising oats, so therefore I do not approach oats as a cash crop. My environment is good at raising corn, beans, cows, wheat, red clover, alfalfa, uh, various livestock. So I do enterprises that work in my niche, and then I figure out which enterprises that I like to do that work in my niche, and I concentrate on that enterprise, and you work outward from there and you find linkages and ways to make that enterprise work better. Fourth big thought. Uh, when I started out, uh, we obviously started out in organics in the late 80s when there were no markets. And so define your customer. And obviously the customer that is closer to you is a more desirable customer than someone who is far away from you. People crave personal interaction. They crave a personal connection. If you're starting out, start on a small scale. Uh, no, when we started out, no sale was too small. No customer was, you know, he, he's an alternative. He's a crazy. We don't want to do business with him. You start out where you're at with what you have, with the tools at hand, and you build outward. But uh, Small sales, local sales, unique products. The reality is, is we cannot compete with Walmart. And so you have to find niches. You have to find ways to outcompete Walmart, whether it be something that they don't sell, whether it be a personal interaction that they don't offer, whether it be supply that they don't offer. Uh, it has to be, you have to find some diversity there. Okay. I've used this idea over and over again, and it applies to my personal operation. You need diverse production. So on our farm, uh, we have 10 different revenue streams. That's not a hard and fast number. This is, a, this is kind of a joke. You know, I tell my wife that as long as five of them are profitable, we'll survive. If over five are profitable, we do pretty good. She jokes, we barely make five. But you need a diverse uh, production model. And, uh, you know, I understand that the more diverse it is, the more complex, the more things you have to juggle. But the more diverse you are, the more you're able to weather extremes. Uh, we just had the researcher up here showing us the oats year. Okay, so we raise oats pretty much every year. And we also raise wheat. And uh, I've gone a long time raising good wheat and getting human consumption premiums. And the last two years, we have raised bad wheat. We've had two wet springs. The moisture comes in in May, right when the wheat's blooming, and disease moves into the wheat, and it hurts. 
if based on my previous production model, I had planted the whole farm to wheat because I'd had a 10 year run of phenomenal yields and phenomenal whatever, if I'd put all my eggs in that basket, I would probably not be here today, I'd be out of business. But we had diversity in place. And so even though I was, a, I, I was able to lose, in effect, lose those two years of wheat production and still survive because of the diversity within the system. So multiple ventures. Uh, in reality, we probably have more than 10 uh, revenue streams. You know, there's the old joke, we harvest everything but the pigs squeal. Well, on our farm, we attempt to sell everything but the pigs squeal. You, we, we have diversity. And diversity is a good thing. It's a good thing up until the point that you cannot manage those streams with the attention that they need. So every individual is going to be able to manage a, di a greater or lesser amount of diversity based upon their skill set, their resources, their environment, etc. So you need to figure out what that mix is for you. Uh, final thought. At, at K-State I had a professor, his name is Dr. Ehler, he liked to stand in front of the classroom. He said, you've got a pig, you've got a breachy pig. You go out every morning, pigs out, chewing through the garden, tearing stuff up. How much of the pig do you have to stop? Keep him in his pen. How much of the how much how much of the pig do you have to stop to keep the pig in the pen? Anybody? How much of the pig do you have to stop? Do we have some pig farmers here? You gotta stop about a sixteenth of an inch on the end of his nose. If you stop that first sixteenth of an inch, that old boar, the other 300 pounds isn't going anywhere. So every morning, Dr. Ehler's point that he was attempting to teach us here is that you need to figure out what the limiting factor is. The term is most limiting factor. So if, if you want to be successful as a farmer, if every morning you step outside your door, there's always a hundred things that are screaming for your attention, right? There's always a crisis here. There's a crisis there. There's always something that needs fixed. If every day in the morning when you step out your door and you're able to look at the enterprise and figure out what is the most limiting factor, what one thing can I address today that will make the whole thing work better? And you attack that one thing. And you do that every morning. You assess the whole diversity of your operation, all of your different streams and things and you figure out what will make me the most profit today I hate to use the term profit but what will best utilize my time today you address that limiting factor and you will be successful due to years of farming and erosion uh, we do not have the limestone base in our soils that you found out in western Kansas where the topsoil was made from limestone our topsoil is the wind blown less with some limestone and clay and gravel crap underneath it. But anyway, we have an anomaly. So in my situation, I'm missing one nutrient. Can anybody tell me what that nutrient is? The nutrient that I'm missing is calcium. Calcium. You have to have calcium in your soil to balance and make the NPK natural exchanges work. If the calcium is out of balance, then the natural exchanges of nitrogen with the atmosphere won't happen. Our potassium goes off the chart. Anytime they take a soil test, it's rated as very high, it's available, you don't want to add it. But if you let it and the calcium get out of whack, then you have problems. And so we need calcium. We need lime. The nitrogen comes from our crop rotation, our cows and our legumes. Uh, Spreading manure, rotational grazing cows, I treat my fields as pastures. Cows go on my fields. Every piece of my ground is farmed, up to and including almost the yard. And so at, at, at different times of the year, livestock are on every acre. Livestock are wonderful. They, they cycle phosphorus for you. They cycle potassium for you. They cycle all the others. Uh, but I do not buy supplemental nutrition. I have not. Ever. I, never have either. I buy calcium, high-grade calcium. 
limestone. Uh, we have found, we have seen that by feeding our cattle calcium carbonate, uh, that was Bart, you know, looked at this soil test years ago. And he looked at our soil test, and we were having problems with miscarriages, abortions, prolapses. We were having all kinds of herd health issues. And I showed Bart that soil test. He said, well, they're out of whack. Correct the calcium. And so I have corrected the calcium in our feedlot. We feed our cows calcium carbonate because the manure, we pen and pack and uh, bed the cows in straw and we build manure piles. And we were feeding that cow supplemental, the calves in the feedlot and the mother cows when they eat the corn and the, the ration, uh, uh, the, the calcium's going through them. It's going into the manure pile, all the manure pile. So I don't know, I'm not, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, balance more than I am buying solutions. Uh, try and grow solutions. <laughs>